Support for Carolina Business Review, made possible by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services, with more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. Well, more reality about the state of real estate. Now, it seems that many economists believe it will be 2014 before we begin to see any broad appreciation in home prices. The commercial sector, however, shows a bit more life. And the budget battles in both North, uh, North Carolina and South Carolina, Raleigh and Columbia, continue. CBR is the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. Welcome again. I'm Chris William. And on this edition, Natalie English from Charlotte's Chamber and David Lockwood of, of Columbia's Collier International. Later on, Rick Elias of marketing phenom Red Ventures. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also this edition, by King and Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded May 27, 2011. On this week's program, David Lockwood of Collier's International. Natalie English of the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce and special guest Rick Elias, CEO of Red Ventures. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome again to our program. Uh, almost happy summer, you guys. Thank you Thank very you. much. Good to have you both here. Uh, Natalie, I want to start with you. Uh, the Charlotte Chamber, your role at the Charlotte Chamber, you're involved in a little bit about public policy, <laughs> a right? Bit. I'm saying that a little bit facetiously. You know, now that the, uh, at least in North Carolina, the General Assembly, the House and the Senate have kind of banged out how they'd like to see the budgets. Now comes the business of making sausages, so to speak. Um, what are the tough choices that North Carolina is going to have to face when we talk about a $2.5 billion hole, and constitutionally we can't have that, and we have to get to the point where we don't have a deficit? So. Where is it going to show up? Is it going to show up in the agencies that help the indigent and, and, and those that are at poverty level? Is it going to show up in the education? Is it going to show up in, in, in programs that support small business? I mean, where is it going to be most obvious in your opinion? It's going to show up a little bit everywhere, but I think that we'll see differences in the way we fund and pay for transportation infrastructure. Education certainly is going to feel uh, some pain, but the legislature's working with the governor and the five Democrats who voted in the House for the budget so that there's a veto-proof vote there if they can hang on to them. So now, it's even more complicated. Now, explain, explain the meaning behind that. Explain why that's, that's important. If the Republican majority in the House and Senate pass a budget and send it to the governor and she vetoes it, they need to be able to override that veto to get what they want done. The Senate has a veto-proof majority. The Republicans can override a veto, but the House does not. They need five Democrats to vote with them. They convinced five Democrats to vote on their first version of the budget. So the version that comes from the Senate back to the House for concurrence probably next week has to be one that at least five Democrats will vote for also. And what's your gut about that? My gut is, and, is that they'll try to figure it out until the very last minute. The five Democrats have been in all the closed door meetings and are making their demands heard, including additional funding for education. Are you surprised uh, of that type of alliance? Are you surprised that that has, uh, that those five Democrats have gone along and the Republicans have, have bent enough to go that direction? I think that those five Democrats have found themselves in a very smart position. They, they're still at the table. Any Democrat who's decided to just say no has just said no and they've been locked out of the debate. And, and David, let's, let's come to you and let's talk about the contentiousness and the length 
of the budgets, uh, the budget negotiations that have been going on. Why have they taken so long, and why has it been so contentious in South Carolina? Well, it's a South Carolina perspective. The budget took far longer this year than it ever has before. Normally, it's a couple of days debate in the Senate. This week, this year, five weeks of debate. And, and I think, as we've been talking, that uh, the legislators, the senators, all elected officials are scrutinizing everything these days. And as Natalie pointed out to me earlier, uh, the people that have been elected, they really think that they know everything that's out there. And this new group of power, this new um, uh, power block that is out there, they think they have all the answers. But nothing is getting passed without, without a lot of scrutiny. And so thus we saw five weeks of debate in the Senate alone in South Carolina, and it held up so much legislation that was being considered, that should have been considered. You, you, do you get a sense that they felt they, they had a mandate to... to um, because of the last election, they had a mandate to scrutinize things that much? Or do you think that there was a, uh, arrogance probably isn't the right word, no. maybe it is, but, but maybe there's a, there's, a, there's a level that we know better or we know best? I think that there is an air of ownership. Everyone needs to take ownership of the problems, and so everyone thinks that they may have the answers. So all budget items are scrutinized by everyone. And when everyone scrutinizes it, Everyone thinks they have that. Everyone has an opinion of the way it should turn out, and that just takes a long debate through the process. Yeah, Natalie, you shaking your head with that? You agree with that? I do, and I think that um, I don't think it's arrogance. I think it's also that they've watched uh, people making laws for decades, and so they think they've figured out how they could do things better going forward. And and they all want their voices heard. They they've all been elected by a certain number of people, and they believe. They should have their voices heard, and it's not just budgets being scrutinized. Budgets probably more so than ever before because of our, our gaps in, right. in both our state budgets, but every policy is, is being scrutinized. Policies that were made decades ago are being brought back up again because these people have been watching laws being made and think they know a better way to run our states. Is that a dangerous way to approach uh, making public policy, to, to be... To, to look at everything, e even the things that have worked in the past, and say, uh, uh, nothing's off the table now. We're going to look at a policy set 35 years ago, and we don't even know if that one's good anymore. I don't think it's a, a bad way. It's a different way, and it's a more timely way of making policy. And, and you have to remember the people in leadership today, at least in North Carolina, haven't been in a leadership position, and, and for so long the same people have been. So I think it makes sense that, that new people need to learn more but it takes a little bit longer. It, it's fair game. We're in a new economy. We've come through so much in the last five years. Business is transacted differently and government is run differently. So I think it's fair game that they have these questions and that they look at the budgets in this extreme manner. Uh, let me ask you from the federal level because that seems to be the clearest level. And I, this is going to be my word and my, my phrase. Uh, I'm going to call it political foolishness. And I, I call it that not because it's completely foolish, but it seems like there's a lot of brink, brinksmanship and a lot of one-upping going on. And, and, and at a time when the national debt is, of course, historic, and we don't have a lot more wiggle room when it comes to debt, and we are close to the edge, and if this country does get into fiscal problems, uh, that is something we can't unwind very easily. So do you get the sense, Natalie, I'll start with you, do you get the sense that we're, that, that those in power, the politicos now that have been elected, are still playing an old game of partisan politics and are, are not taking seriously maybe their role as well they should be? I think that partisan politics is a part of the game, and each party believes they have the right answer, whatever the policy might be. And sometimes they agree, rarely, but sometimes they do. And they want their party to stay in control, even if it's not that individual running for re-election. They want the party in control. So they are thinking about how do we do things here in a way to assure that during the next election, our party will be in the majority. It, it, is, it is how our democracy works. Mm -hmm. David? I agree. It is partisan politics, but that is the way the democracy works. That's why you have so much debate that is out there. If we didn't have that form of government, don't know where we would be. Uh, okay, well, I, I think I'm not going to be able to chase this one much longer because you all are being very kind and very <laughs> articulate. So we'll, 
we'll move on. It just seems like there still is a lot of frustration on people's, uh, uh, it, you know, average Joe Sixpack is very frustrated with the way that partisan politics has taken us to uh, contentious very contentious right. debate. Not th- kind, not not respectful, but contentious. I think part of that is 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 the people have access to more information today than we did 20, 30 years ago. And so we as individuals also think we know the best answer. So one year we're telling the Democrats that they're not getting it right, so we're going to throw them out and put the Republicans in power. And then the Republicans start doing what they think they heard us say during the last election. But wait a minute, we didn't mean to say that, the people say. And so then we throw them out. And that, I believe, this is my prediction, I believe we're going to continue to go back and forth, maybe not every two years, but we're going to see Republicans in power for a little while and then Democrats in power for a little while. And this back and forth is going to happen because I believe the American people are a little fickle. So you think throwing the bums out every cycle is going to become more of, of, of a norm than it is an exception? I think so. Yeah, possibly. I didn't even ask you this, David. Let's take just another quick minute. Uh, Commercial real estate. Uh, We have seen some of the numbers in residential real estate, and a lot of economists agree that these home prices are not coming back, even in the Carolinas, even along the coast, even in the mountains, even some of these these finer properties and in the urban areas. What what do you say about commercial real estate versus residential real estate? Well, the commercial real estate sector has seen improvement at a more rapid pace than residential, and we've seen very little improvement in residential. The commercial sector really has been um, keen on jobs, and we've seen a resurgence in a lot of leasing in the markets in North and South Carolina, industrial leasing, office leasing, even retail is starting to come back. So that's been very good news. We see those markets improving. The markets that we're still concerned about are land development and even the investment market. That's coming back slowly, but it's coming back because Prices are very depressed right now, and there are a lot of buyers out there, a lot of money that are chasing very good deals, hoping to see significant returns in the future. So I'm more encouraged about commercial real estate, but just purely from the standpoint of businesses have started making decisions, long-term decisions. Two years ago, no one was making any decisions. Mm, right. We finally see corporate America and businesses making good decisions. Thank you, David. You know, speaking of politics, next week on this program, he is the mayor of Charlotte. Uh, At the point of politics in the Queen City, we'll talk about the Democratic National Convention, among how the fortunes of the Queen City are returning or in which direction they are heading. And then in two weeks, Dr. Tom Ross, the president of the UNC system in the triangle, will be here, former Davidson College president, now the president of the UNC system. If you have ever spent any time at all at a a conference or a seminar or a summit to learn about marketing or communications or networking, then you know how truly confusing and homogenized all of that can seem. What is important to know about marketing now, really? And how do sales relate to marketing? And especially, how does all of that fit into the Wild West atmosphere of the Internet? Well, Red Ventures is a marketing company in Fort Mill, South Carolina, that claims to have cracked the code, and I say quote unquote, to the entire direct marketing process. Joining us now is Red Ventures Chief Executive Officer and co-founder Rick Elias. Uh, Rick, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. You know, Rick, let's talk about this. You know, we talk about marketing and communications and those terms are just, you know, we we interchange marketing and communications and public relations. um, and you guys say on your website that you've cracked the code. What does that mean? Does that mean that you know the DNA of the important things to do about marketing? In your opinion, what is this? The world has changed in, in how technology and the Internet have completely changed our daily lives. It has also changed the life in business, the life of marketing. Traditionally, a company would say, I'll hire a marketing director. That person will hire an agency that person in turn will hire a call center and it will start advertising. And that model relied a lot on kind of human uh, gut, on instincts. Technology has created now a way where you can capture a lot more information in that process. So think about it this way. Businesses started outsourcing processes that were efficiency looking processes. So you were looking to cut costs. We think now that marketing is at the other end of that spectrum where companies are really struggling to make this work and they're looking at, okay, there's a more effective way to do this. There's some ways that you can use technology to connect 
what is your advertising to your sales processes, to your fulfillment processes, and bring it all together. And use that information in a very virtuous way to make better decisions as you go. So how does, how does a company, small, mid, large corporation, how does a company need to think about marketing now? Is it dramatically different how they thought about it before? As, as newspapers struggle, as uh, a lot of this advertising starts moving online, uh, the old techniques don't work anymore. It used to be that someone in a local market could say, hey, I'm going to spend my dollars on the newspaper, on radio, on TV, and get a bang for the buck, so mm -hmm. to speak. Today, more and more eyeballs are moving to the Internet. And in the Internet, it's really kind of a much tougher game because all the national players, people that are using technology, are now kind of dominating the game. If you look at Google, for example, and you were to do a, a something in paid search, for example, you will really struggle as a local merchant to be able to compete in the first two spots of Google mm. where all the clicks go. Because the people that have the technology to do that dominate the environment. So I do. I think that we're at the early stages of this. I think what's happening with social media, uh, the dominance of Facebook, what's happening with Twitter, uh, we're, we're in the early stages of what will continue to be a very explosive change of, uh, of landscape as it relates to marketing. Mm -hmm. Natalie? You know, I, I wonder, how does that impact the small business, the mom and pop shop that um, doesn't have the, 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 the resources to hire someone on their staff to manage this for them? You know, that's a very good question. I, I think small businesses uh, will need to figure out more viral ways to get their, their message out. Social media is going to change uh, the way, you know, think about the time, it, I, I believe the last numbers I saw is Facebook is like the third largest country in the world uh, in terms of, and then they're, they're adding uh, new subscribers every day. You mean day just by a, membership headcount? Yeah, it's China, India, and then Facebook. <laughs> So in, in Facebook, really, their business model is all about user experience. There's not really a, a revenue-driven model, although I, I believe they're quite profitable. They're not, uh, they're not public. That said, that so I think the small businesses are going to have to figure out how do they interact with their own, uh, th their own customers and how, if you think about social media, it really is almost word of mouth on, 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 a, on a megaphone. Mm -hmm. right? Because what, that's what you want, the, the ultimate advertising is when you go tell somebody, hey, you should go to this restaurant, you should go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So that's what social media does. So I think small businesses are going to really have to figure out how do they use their own customers to become their own marketers. David? First, I'm fascinated by the company. I, I think you've taken a company that you started in a basement and 10 or 11 years later you're 1,200 plus employees and incredibly successful. And I've read where you were voted Charlotte's best, best place to work. So obviously there is a huge amount of success there. And what I hear is that there's strong motivation for the employees, for the sales force. How do you motivate them and how do you create that successful sales force and workforce to get you to this point in such a short period of time? It's 97% luck. <laughs> I, I look back at all the left turns this could have taken and, and we wouldn't be here. And, and every day I start almost, we, we do monthly all employee meetings and, I, and, and there's a version of this that comes out and I actually get mocked. Our culture is all very informal and I get mocked because I say, this will end. These are the good old days. This will end. There will be a day that we'll stand here and have not great news. And our collective goal is to make this last as long as possible. You know, my personal goal is that the next CEO is going to have to deal with that, <laughs> right? But the point of that is there's a tremendous amount of luck that happens for one to get to this point. And, and not believing that is, I think, very dangerous. I think most entrepreneurs, that's when I see entrepreneurs that have done this a couple times. I have tremendous respect because that's skill. I believe we've been lucky. That said, and to answer your question, when we started this company, Dan and I literally looked at each other and goes, we, we, we got to figure out a couple principles that we can come to every time and, and kind of say, okay, that's the tiebreaker. And the main principle was we want to build a company we would want to work for. We're very unique people, right? And so that's not for everybody, but we wanted a place where hierarchy didn't matter, where it was casual, yet it was intense, it was competitive, but it was respectful, but it was fun, where you could get paid really well if you did well and it didn't matter. And then slowly but surely, because cultures don't get baked overnight, 
we are in a place now where the, the byproduct of best company to work for is really a culture where people love working at. And you, the energy that you sense when you walk into a building is, is magnificent. And it's perhaps the biggest achievement. It's not 1,200 employees. It's not how profitable we are. Is that we have a place that people really love coming to work at. So, Rick, when you say 97% of the success is luck, is that, I mean, what are you saying about that? Because we all in business, we'd like to think, you know, we have this command and control sensibility that we can control a lot of it. Some of it's luck, but no, maybe a little bit extra hard work, maybe that extra weekend, maybe that one more dinner is going to do it. So what do you say when you say 90% luck? Does that mean that, you know, don't try so hard. Know that part of it is going to come or not going to come. I think hard work, commitment, um, going that extra step is a prerequisite. There's lots of entrepreneurs who put more than their fair share of work ethic and, and energy into something and that have not been lucky. I think ultimately any business relies on you got to end up in a good business model and you got to be in good macro trends. I think we benefit from both of those. Our business model evolved. We really struggled. We almost went under a year in. We started this business in January of 2000 and the internet bubble burst shortly thereafter. And we probably should have gone under. And for three or four years, we were paying nothing to ourselves. We went through a couple of cycles where we had to let go of a lot of people. And we just lived to fight another day. And eventually we landed on a business model that started making sense, that started evolving, where we really could scale it. So I look back and I, I by no means take that for granted. And I, 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 not, I don't worry, but I know it will change. I know someday there's someone in a garage who's after us. And I think that's neat. I, I love the competitive spirit of that. Mm -hmm. So, Rick, you've created this fantastic place to work, and by all accounts, um, that's what it is. So are you having trouble accessing qualified workforce? And if so, are there things that the educational institutions in this community might be able to do to help with that? Yeah. It's a great question, Natalie. Um, you know, I, first of all, I, I, I try to stay out of the way. We have an, an unbelievable management uh, team. We've attracted just great talent. And ultimately, that's how the culture gets passed on. And, and that really is a, the, the key of our business and our management. Uh, it is difficult to find the type of talent we want in our organization that will be attracted to the kinds of ways we manage. And depending on the positions, so we have technology positions and marketing positions and management and sales, depending on the position, but in many cases, is less than 3% of the people that apply get hired. In many cases, you have to come in twice, you have 10 interviews. We want to make sure that you're additive to the culture. We, all, we want people in that feel the same way. We want great athletes. You don't have to be great at something. You just have to be, I, I've heard once this concept of the self person, self-motivated, self-driven, self-aware. And we love to find young people that have achieved a lot in their young age, but that are, that, that are self-motivated. We'll, we'll, we'll make rock stars out of them. So this year for the first time, we started working with some colleges. We put a college program, I think in two weeks we have 13, 14 new uh, analysts starting, and we have 15 uh, summer interns starting all the same day, which is going to be great to get like 30 college uh, <laughs> kids coming, descending on our, on our little campus the same day. Uh, but over time, we're actually speaking to uh, four or five colleges right now about could we help design the curriculum? Could we help with some of the technology uh, things so that when people graduate, they're ready to jump in and, and, and help us in that regard. And we're having conversations as we speak with the head of this university because we want to get there. We believe that we got to create sort of a farm system that allows us to grow. In the random event, we continue to be lucky. We have the bench to continue to grow because that's our biggest issue. Human capital is our constraint. Sure. We spend time now figuring out what not to do, and that, will, that won't be forever, but it's, it's people. Can yeah. you teach a self person. I love Absolutely. that description. Absolutely. I know Absolutely. them. Can Absolutely. you teach it? Absolutely. Our average age, I think it's 28. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's young. We're, we're going to have to stop there. Unfortunately, Rick, I didn't, we didn't even get a chance to ask you about the, you know, the basics of what we need to know when it comes to marketing. We'll have you back to do that. But congratulations and good to have you. Thank you, program. sir. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice Thank to you. see you. Thank you. Uh, David, good to see you. Thanks for coming up from Columbia, as Thank always. You. Natalie? Glad to be here. Thank good you. to have you here. Thanks. Thank you for watching our program. Uh, until next week, we certainly hope that your summer starts well and your business is good. Until then, I'm Chris Wooding. Good night.
Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King & Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. Additional funding provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services. With more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by viewers like you. Thank you. You may write us at Carolina Business Review, 3242 Commonwealth Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205.